Good afternoon. Once again, Boston criminal defense attorney Ben Herbal is here, now with another video blog update on the Aaron Hernandez first degree murder trial. On day 21, the prosecution laid out its forensic DNA testing of certain items. They marched up scientists from a Mass State Police crime lab who had tested and confirmed the DNA of Odin Lloyd, Aaron Hernandez, and Carlos Ortiz. Things got interesting when DNA analyst Diane Fife Biagiotti testified about the results of her testing. She concluded that the joint paper found at the crime scene had the DNA of both Aaron Hernandez and Odin Lloyd, but she could not find a detectable amount of DNA on the five shell casings found at the crime scene. She explained that usually once a cartridge is fired from a gun, any DNA that was on the shell casing is usually blown off once it's fired. However, she was able to detect Aaron Hernandez's DNA on the single shell casing found in the Enterprise rent-a-car dumpster. But on cross-examination, James Sultan blew that testing out of the water. If the jury was curious as to how that single spent shell casing had Hernandez's DNA on it while the others didn't, it became obvious. Before Ms. Biagiotti tested for DNA on that shell casing, no one from the state police or any other law enforcement agency had told her that when the shell casing was initially recovered from the dumpster, it had a piece of gum stuck to it that the manager from Enterprise had stuck to a piece of paper and then the shell casing when clearing out Hernandez's car. Biagiotti testified that had she been informed of that, it certainly would have affected her findings, as there would have been a high likelihood of transfer of Hernandez's DNA if he had been the one who had chewed that gum. Not only did this provide a very real explanation as to how DNA would have been detected on a spent shell casing, but it really helped the defense with their theory that the police were both sloppy and perhaps even pushing too hard to create evidence that would implicate Hernandez in this case. The defense also brought up the fact that Biagiotti did not compare any of the DNA found on any of the items tested to the DNA of Ernest Wallace, as she had not been provided a DNA sample of Wallace. This sparked another hearing outside the presence of the jury. The prosecution argued that this was misleading as Wallace had not initially provided a DNA sample, and by the time he did provide a DNA sample, the scientists had already determined that the DNA on the items was that of Hernandez. The defense disputed that, uh, that particular order of events, but in any event said that by not ever comparing the DNA swabs of the items to Wallace's DNA showed a bias and a lack of a complete investigation. The judge ruled that the defense had a constitutional right to argue any evidence of bias or an incomplete investigation by the police, but as a matter of fairness and to put things in proper perspective for the jury, the prosecution would be able to offer evidence as to why they weren't able to initially obtain Wallace's DNA and why when they did, they believed it had already become a moot point. On day 22, Jennifer Fournier, the nanny for Hernandez's daughter, took the stand. She explained that she first started working for Hernandez and his wife, Cheyenne, in the spring of 2013, and even accompanied them on vacation to Mexico to care for their daughter, AVL. On Father's Day, June 16, 2013, she had been babysitting for AVL when Aaron and Cheyenne went to the South Street Cafe in Providence. Just after midnight, Ernest Wallace and Carlos Ortiz showed up at the North Attlebar home while she was there. They arrived in the Nissan Altima that we've heard so much about in this case. They told Ms. Fournier that they had just spoke with Aaron and that he and Cheyenne would be back in the house in 20 minutes, so Ms. Fournier let them in to wait. The prosecution then played video of when Aaron and Cheyenne returned. And at one point on the video, while Ms. Fournier is sitting on the couch, around 1 a.m., you can see Aaron walk behind her holding what looks to be a black gun. That same video would come into play later when a Glock employee identifies it as a Glock handgun. This video also fit with the prosecution's timeline as it shows Hernandez leaving with Ortiz and Wallace in the Nissan around 1.30 a.m. I actually felt sort of bad for Ms. Fournier during the second part of her testimony relating to events that happened in Boston just two nights prior on Friday, June 14, 2013. She now found herself in a very awkward position of having to talk about details of that night where if everything went down the way she claimed, it was pretty embarrassing and she really didn't do anything wrong to find herself in that position. On that Friday night, she had gone out with her girlfriend in Boston. 
Around 2 a.m., they were in front of the W Hotel in the theater district, walking back to her car, when she spotted Hernandez sitting in a black SUV parked in front of the hotel. She yelled, Aaron. And when Aaron looked up, sitting from his SUV, he saw Miss Fournier and told her to hop in the car. Odin Lloyd was in the front seat at that time, and another man was in the back. After a quick conversation with her friend, Miss Fournier and her friend got into the car with Aaron Hernandez. Now, according to Miss Fournier, she asked Hernandez to drop her off at her car, which was parked in a garage a few blocks away. The next thing she knew, she was on Route 93 headed south with them. She claims that she kept asking Hernandez to turn around and bring her back to her car, but he just turned up the rap music louder and continued to pass a blunt back and forth between the two other men. They eventually reached Ronald C. Meyer Drive, where the third man jumped out at the end of the street to walk the rest of the way to the Hernandez home so that Cheyenne would not see Aaron in the area. Hernandez, Lloyd, and the two ladies then went to the flop apartment in Franklin that we discussed before, and that's when you could tell that Miss Fournier really got uncomfortable on the stand. She testified that she continuously asked Hernandez for a ride home, but he instead took them to this Franklin apartment where he poured some wine and at one point called Miss Fournier into a bedroom. In that bedroom, she says Hernandez tries, uh, tried to kiss her, but she pulled away, saying that she was uncomfortable because she was his daughter's nanny. She said that Aaron said he understood, and at that point he just passed out on a bed. She and her friend were then able to call a taxi which took them back to their car in Boston. Now on cross-examination, the defense pointed out that this wasn't really the kidnapping she tried to make it look like on direct. She admitted that when Hernandez kissed her on the bed, she didn't pull back right away. She actually kissed him back for a while before she stopped it. She also admitted that while they were all on their way from Boston to North Attleboro, everyone was joking and laughing and in good spirits. The fact that Hernandez and Lloyd were rapping along to the lyrics playing and seeming to have a good time together was also important for the defense to demonstrate. This would go against the prosecution's theory that something happened on this particular Friday night that led to a falling out between the two men and eventually Odin's murder. Witnesses over the next few days would talk about their observations of Hernandez and Lloyd that evening, and the jury would also be shown surveillance of the two men, both inside and outside of Rumor Nightclub, that night. Stay tuned as I will be providing much more on that when I do my next video blog. Please subscribe to my channel, Herbalist Law, to stay updated.